Hey guys, Crystal here. As some of you know, I've been doing long distance races for almost 17 years now. During that time, I've seen a lot of changes and learned a lot. That's why I'm grateful for having discovered Sword Energy Drink. Previously, like most endurance runners, I carried my hydration and fuel separately, and also because I am a very salty sweater, I would have to carry separate electrolytes or salt pills. Now, with Sword, I'm able to get everything in one simple product that contains only six natural ingredients. Recently, I did the math on what I used to take in during a typical marathon and was floored to discover that I was putting in over 30 different ingredients into my body. So, if you're looking to simplify your nutrition strategy, I would strongly encourage you to check out the information that's available at drinksword.com. If you decide you want to test it out for yourself, be sure to use the discount code HEARTLANDRUNNER to save 20%. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the Heartland Running Podcast. Join Crystal, Andy, and Stephen as they explore all things running related in the Heartland and beyond. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show this evening. I've been away for just a little bit, and I'm glad to be back, and I'm glad to have a very special guest. But first of all, I'm Andy. I'm Crystal. And I'm Stephen. And welcome to the show. So I'm really excited about the guests we're going to have tonight because we really... Everyone here likes to eat, and especially once we're done with a long run or done with a race, you know, we're, we're hungry, we're starving, and we need to feel ourselves, and that's what, probably one of the most important things that we can do during our training uh, is to feel ourselves properly. So I'm very excited to have Meredith Vaselli on, and I'm going to give you just a quick introduction, and she can correct anything that's wrong or make any additions. First of all, she's an athlete, a coach, a foodie, uh, a wife, and mom to two little boys, and uh, she's also the creator of the revolutionary Strong and Sexy Runner, and I definitely need help with that, with getting strong and getting even more sexy than what I am right now. Um, So, and also, she, uh, and then she swims, bikes, fuel, and then um, uh, 3HU Nutrition Health Coaching Programs. Hopefully, we can get a little bit more into that, learn a little more about that. Uh, She is a Ironman Wisconsin finisher and then a Boston Marathon qualifier, the creator and founder of Bio Endurance Incorporated, uh, which is endurance and nutrition coaching. Uh, She is a certified integrative nutrition holistic health coach. That's a mouthful. Let's learn about that. And then a certified USAT triathlon and running coach. Welcome to the show. Did I miss anything? I think you got it all. <laughs> that, was impre- <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> List all that. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here with all of you. And you, yeah, you got it all. <laughs> okay, Actually, there, 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 is, there is even more on there. She's being very modest, but we had to kind of condense it so that we didn't do the whole show on her intro. <laughs> oh, thanks, Crystal. <laughs> okay, well, I, I've got I've got a few questions, and you know, I I would like to know a little bit about. Uh, you know, what, what, what is a certified integrative nutrition holistic health coach? What, what is that? So, um, it's a, it's a profession where, um, I went to, uh, I went to school for nutrition. Um, but rather than I sort of investigated all the different routes and I, um, you know, you can go and be a registered dietitian and follow a more traditional route. Um, but what really appealed to me was, looking at nutrition from a holistic perspective, um, looking at the whole body, how one thing affects everything else, looking at root cause issues um, in the body and looking at food, not just as fuel, but as something that can either heal you or make you not well. Um, So I did a program um, through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition in health coaching and then continue on um, with with uh, updating my my skills as a nutritionist and sports nutritionist. And um, so I love working with athletes. I love working with uh, runners, triathletes specifically, and really helping them hone in on an area that, you know, as you said, is very important to all of us. We all love to eat. We need to eat. And it can be an area of a lot of confusion, um, sometimes can add extra stress when you don't know what you're doing or if you're, you know, you're trying to fuel yourself well and you're trying to train for all sorts of things and you're just not feeling well, you're not having the right energy or you're trying to lose weight while you're training and you find that it's actually backfiring. So there's a lot of really interesting things that you can dig into um, when you look at uh, nutrition from a really holistic perspective 
and uh, sort of applying it and and seeing that it's it's very individual by person too. It's not sort of a one size fits all approach, uh, dietary approach to everybody. I think whenever you say confusing, that was really interesting to me because I, I work in the food industry, uh, developing food items and getting them to market. And, and I, I speak with a lot of customers that, uh, that have a lot of concerns about their food choices and their food choices are changing um, to, and, you know, we're, we're clean, cleaner labels, uh, less preservatives. Uh, you know, there's a reason why those are in there, but there's also a good reason why we need to take those out. And so, you know, it, that, that does make processing of foods a lot more difficult but I, I know that there's a lot of people out there that they will they'll read something on the internet and then it's it's immediately true and, yeah. and so that's one of the things that has been a challenge for me is I've had to really educate myself on you know the the, the true information and and how that food works uh, you know I, I do do have a, a food science degree mm-hmm. and um, and so it, it's it's difficult to try to get people to understand that you know okay you're you're going down the right road here but you know this is this is the true the the true facts about it and right. and do you feel like sometimes in, in your work you're kind of having to debunk some things you're kind of having to reprogram people's thought process uh, sometimes yeah I think I think what's happening um, quite often now is we're so overwhelmed with information and it's coming from all different directions constantly. And so to sort of sift through what is um, alarmist and what is um, not actual science um, versus what is tried and true, um, you know, that's a lot of what I do is to help guide people and help them make sense of things and, you know, not to get oh, stressed out about, you know, everything that that's on the shelves too. You know, we can, you can really get yourself quite not just confused, but stressed as well if you go into a grocery store and you feel paralyzed because you don't know what to choose and all labels are calling out, you know, different aspects of different things that are in them and you're trying to remember, you know, what's good and what's not. And, you know, the, the news media doesn't really help either when they pull, you know, little highlights of a specific study and will say, you know, this week coffee's bad and then the next week coffee's good for your brain and helps to prevent Alzheimer's. And uh, so there's, you know, there's this constant flow of information that people need to you know be aware of but also make sense of and again apply to themselves so nutrigenomics is this this um you know up and coming and and uh, really interesting area where people are are being able to be tested to understand how their genes work uh in relation to food and and then be able to make better choices and um know that, you know, certain things will cause certain genes to, um, to act in a certain way. And so again, it goes back to a topic that I really emphasize in my coaching programs, which is um, bio-individuality, that there is no one size fits all diet that's ideal for everyone, even though you would think that if you, you know, uh, look through a newspaper or magazine or, or, you know, uh, scrolled through your Facebook feed and you would think, okay, I've got to do the ketogenic diet. No, I've got to follow paleo. No, I've got to do this. And it's like, you know, it, it again, it goes back to confusion, but sorting it out and then really taking some foundational principles because there are things that we can all agree on, you know, some basic things and apply it to yourself and then start to see how, how it's working for you. How are you feeling? That's really the best way to figure it out is to start experimenting. Use your body as an experiment and see what's working for you and what's making you uh, thrive, whether you're training or whether you're, you know, just sitting in your cubicle, whatever it might be, you want to feel good. And you don't want to be scared about, about, you know, making choices at the grocery store. So Okay, well, I, I think you just completely busted what my next question was, was going to be. And, <laughs> okay. and, and what that was is, you know, since since we we, we talk running on the, on this show, um, I was really wanting to know kind of the general breakdown of what a daily diet for, you know, just your your everyday athlete amateur yeah. athlete, you know, what that should be. And and then you you mentioned that it's going to be different for everyone and, and it's going to be individualistic. Uh, so, but I'm going to go ahead and ask the question and just yeah. kind of see where you take us up. You know, what, 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 what is that diet going to look like in terms of, you know, the, your, your, your carbs, your proteins, um, you know, what, what does that look like? Sure. So, um, I think there are some basic tenets of, of sound and solid nutrition that we can all sort of Uh, aim for. And then within that, there's going to be variation depending on your specific likes and dislikes and 
food allergies, sensitivities, things like that. But here are the sort of the, the foundational pieces. Um, number one is water. We all need to be hydrating really, really well all throughout the day. And if we just focused on that as the first thing and get it enough water every day, that has a really powerful effect on crowding out a lot of the sugary, unnecessary beverages that are taking up a lot of space in our diet. So drinking water first. And then the of all the dietary theories out there, I think the only one that that um, no one will dispute is that we need a wide variety and a, a good amount of vegetables in our diet, all different colors, all different types. You know, each one has different properties and different phytonutrients, different protective qualities, which are so important for an athlete as they're putting their body through a high amount of stress with with uh, their daily workouts and just the stress of modern life. So. Plenty of colorful vegetables, um, some amount of, of fruit, low glycemic fruit, preferably, um, meaning fruit that is full of fiber and it's not super sugary. It's not going to cause a real high um, spike in, in blood sugar and insulin. Um, high quality proteins. And I say high quality uh, specifically, not just more protein. I think um, we are living in a culture where it's it's been really emphasized a lot, like the, the fitness industry has done a tremendous job of teaching us that we need protein. So everyone, you know, even the person who just did like a 35 minute Zumba class is going to run down and get a protein shake because they think they need more protein right away. I think we, we've we got plenty of protein in general. Most people are not protein deficient, but they could really make some improvements in terms of shifting from um, low quality protein. And by that, I mean, some examples would be like really processed meats, um, hot dogs, you know, brats, things like that, which are fun once in a while when you're at a baseball game. It's totally fine, but not as like your regular items of protein on your grocery list. Shifting uh, from that to more, um, you know, lean whole meats, uh, grass fed beef, wild salmon, sardines, eggs, things like that. And then moving into healthy fat. I think we're just starting to turn the corner and starting to um, get out of the the 80s and the 90s of the fear of fat altogether. Um, the low fat, the fat free craze is hopefully behind us, but surprisingly, it, it, there's still a, a pretty pretty uh, good amount of the population that that still does look, like look for fat free and low fat. But uh, I think we're starting to to understand and realize the importance of um, healthy fat things like. Um, avocados and nuts and um, you're going to do dairy we do whole whole uh, full fat dairy um, so making sure that that and coconut things like that are a part of the diet um, and then from there you know since we're talking about a, a very active athletic type person I would you know uh, emphasize your starchy vegetables sweet potatoes squashes things that some people are a little bit afraid of because of the carbohydrate content um, you know, getting well, there's it's getting more popular for people to to really moderate their carbohydrates. So sometimes there's confusion there, and they want to lower it and lower it, and they'll they'll shun a sweet potato. But then you know, weeks later, a few days later, their body's craving something sweet, and they'll go way overboard into bag of Oreos or whatever. So you know, adding in those right amount of of um, uh, good carbohydrates. Some amount, of, you don't need a ton, but some amount of whole intact grains, gluten-free grains um, it would be preferable in, in my opinion. Things like brown rice, wild rice, black rice, some quinoa, uh, uh, you know, just a, a moderate amount of that in the diet as well. And I think if you kind of piece those all together into different ratios, depending on your lifestyle, your activity level, your weight loss goals, your blood sugar levels you come up with, with a pretty healthy and pretty sound way of eating. Meredith, I want, I want to back up for just a second to your first point, water. Yeah. I have read articles that say you need to drink a swimming pool a day to, <laughs> you know, you just need a few ounces a day. And I realize everybody's different, but is there a general rule of thumb on how much water you, a person should drink per day? Yeah. Um. So the recommendation that that I make for my client um, and that I follow myself as well is to take your, everybody's having a sip of water. <laughs> all about that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> plug, plug. Um, is to take your current body weight, divide it in half. Let's say you're 
um, 200 pounds. You take your current body weight, you divide it in half, and that's the number of ounces that you want to aim for throughout the day. So for a 200 pound person, that would be a hundred ounces and a hundred ounces for some people will like make their eyes pop out of their head. They're like, Oh, there's no way I've had clients that say, there's no way I could drink that much water because they're just not. And so I, you know, I always find out where people are first. And if they are someone that is drinking like 20 ounces of water a day, well, they're not going to go from 20 to a hundred, but they can go from 20 to 30 and then 30 to 40. And what happens is really cool because they start to realize, like initially they'll say, I'm just not thirsty. I just don't drink because I'm not thirsty. And what has happened is that they deprived their body of an, a good hydration, optimal hydration status for so long that their thirst signals start to be dulled. They start to shut down so they don't feel thirsty anymore. And then when they start regularly adding in the right amount of water, they're suddenly thirsty and they're floored by it because they're like, oh, it's easier to drink more now because I actually feel thirsty. So it's just like that thirst mechanism that's been woken up and the body feels better. It likes it likes this this optimally hydrated status. And so it makes it easier to sustain. So body weight divided in half in ounces. And then for since you your listeners are probably all runners and, and athletes, I do recommend uh, 20 to 24 ounces, more like 24 for men. 20 for women of uh, fluid water, um, unless you're doing a long run, then you want to add in your electrolytes, but per hour of, of running. So you want to get that in while you're running and you add that on to your daily hydration status. So put it all together and you're well hydrated. Across the board, which which we're not going to use water because we just uh, t- we just talked about that, but what is the one thing that's probably the most deficient in the diets of runners? Ooh. Um, please, say please say pizza. Please say pizza. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, vegetables. I think that I, vegetables are just lacking in, in the American diet altogether, but um, athletes as well. You tend to do a little bit better, but still not enough. Uh, specifically, your leafy green vegetables, dark leafy green vegetables, which the way I, I, try to, I try to gently nudge people to eat more vegetables by explaining why it's so important that it is like, it, it, it helps purify your blood. So if you're a runner, you want great blood, right? you want your body, to, you want great circulation, you want energy, green vegetables bring energy, they're, they're like, just sort of the direct receivers of the energy of the sun. So when you're eating dark, le- dark leafy green vegetables, you're going to feel lighter, you're going to feel more energized, um, you're going to notice, uh, start to notice that you just have a little bit um you know, maybe more spring in your step, maybe a little faster runs. So dark leafy green vegetables for one. And then the other would be omega-3 fatty acids. So the in, the inflama- anti-inflammatory healthy fats that we are definitely deficient in as, uh, as, a, as a culture, but runners specifically. So these are the, the, t- the healthy fats that come from, from sardines, from salmon, from walnuts, chia seeds, black seed, those are those are some really good sources that you just don't tend to get enough of every day. Which whenever I go to the grocery store, I always pat myself on the back whenever I buy that bundle of kale. I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm a hero. Yeah. And so I take it home and then I go, <laughs> I don't like to eat this. It's not very good. So here I'm, I'm like chopping it up, mixing it up with salad that I do like. So I can put a little it, cheese over that and it's it, good to go. Used. Um, Good. You are a hero if you bring home a bundle. Of <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying so hard. <laughs> one thing that uh, I'm, I'm really interested in is, you know, what what is the different diet and nutritional needs in men versus versus women? Because I do get a lot of questions from people, especially new runners in our group, and and it'll be it'll be women that are they're, they're there to get fitter and and they're looking for some guidance, maybe lose some weight. You know, how many calories should I be eating? per day and questions like that. And, you know, I've got a pretty good handle on what I need to do, but, you know, I I don't know how to to advise women. Sure. So in general, so do you want me to just talk about women or do you want to talk about? Andy, I can handle this one. You can, you can compare the two or, or, or just however you want to uh, unwrap this question. I've got this one. I've got this one. Andy, you tell them, you tell them this is a man sport. (laughs) (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) 
guy on the Skype call. <laughs> What's that number to call again, Steven? <laughs> hey, I'm going to look up Andy's number real quick. Call, is there a call-in number? Like, yes, call in. They'd be calling. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, they are um, okay, so, so for women, the guidelines that I, I, I work with men and women, but much more women than men. And their needs are usually, well, for one thing, they tend to be trying to lose weight more than men. It just, it just is what it is. And so for them, we really lower their sugar. They're added, any type of added sugar in their diet, added sugar, meaning any food that has sugar added to it. (laughs) So not fruit specifically, or not um, plain dairy that has lactose that has sugar naturally occurring in it, but really getting them to become more aware of the amount of added sugar that's in their diet, and then slowly and gradually pulling that out more and more so that they start to feel better, their their blood sugar is more balanced, which then helps their mood and energy be more balanced, less sugar cravings that way, which is a really, really common struggle for women, uh, particularly in the afternoon. One thing I notice with women is that they don't eat enough for breakfast and don't eat enough protein for breakfast and tend to eat kind of a sugary breakfast or they'll have co- they'll sometimes just skip breakfast and have a latte <laughs> coffee for breakfast. So we really work on um, getting more nutrients into their diet, especially first thing uh, in the morning so that it helps set up a, a a good day where their blood sugar is balanced and they're not riding this roller coaster of high sugar and high energy and then a, a drop in blood sugar and then a low energy and then feeling hungry again and kind of continuing that cycle. So starting with a savory breakfast that's got about 20 grams of, of high quality protein. So that could be like a couple eggs scrambled and you throw your heroic kale on top and <laughs> you have your coffee on the side and, and you call it a day. Start your day like that. Uh, women also really need to pay attention to adding in magnesium rich foods into their diet because they tend to be uh, deficient in magnesium runners specifically. And that is due to a combination of losing it through stress. Uh, stress seeps the body of, of magnesium. Sugar seeps the body of, of magnesium and sweat as well. So we've got this kind of, you know, uh, a triad of, of complications that lead to magnesium deficiency in women, which can make them feel anxious and stressed and unable to wind down and relax um, before bed. So whole foods that are are rich in magnesium are, again, our dark green leafy vegetables, our um, nuts and seeds, um, bananas, avocados, salmon. There's just a, you know, kind of that, that good grocery list of whole foods are also what we need as, as female athletes and, and runners to help keep our body balanced. Another complaint that I hear from a lot of females are uh, uh, lacking in, in zinc and iron. Uh, what, what, are, what are some good foods that are good sources of those vitamins? Um, so zinc, a great source of zinc is egg yolks. Um, and that's why I always tell people to eat the whole egg and not just egg white. So much nutrition, choline, lots of lots of trace minerals and zinc, which you're exactly right, super um, important, is in the, the yolks. So have that for breakfast. And then iron, spinach, scribblers of iron, red meat. Again, choosing grass-fed red meat if you can um, to increase the amount of omega-3 fatty acids, which we're, we're lacking in as well. Um, so combination of, of those two things really can help bring the iron levels up for for women who are, are deficient in those areas, which is quite common. Okay. I've, I've got one more question before we go on to some questions that our listeners submitted on Facebook. Um, but, and this question here is, and, and it's kind of a selfish one because I, I, I'm, I look at how, how I work my, my year to where generally at the start of the year, um, January 1st, I'll start training through the shorter distances into the longer distance. I'll start with 5Ks, 10Ks, move into a half marathon in the spring, and then train for a, a, a marathon in the fall. Does does my diet need to change as 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 I'm changing my distances? Now, you know, my, my half marathon, I'm going to feel just as terrible at the end of that as I am for a marathon because I'm going to hit it hard. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting these hard uh, mm-hmm. and being competitive. Does my diet need to change? according to the distances that I'm running. 
intensity is same. And so you're going all out for every race. It's not like the 5k is like a easy training Mm -hmm. run. You're okay. So the, the foods you need to eat does not change. What needs to change is the volume. The, um, you need to, as your training increases from 5k to half marathon and certainly to marathon, you need to replace more of, of what you're burning. And obviously you're burning lots and lots of calories for the longer distance races. So the other thing that becomes especially important with your longer training runs and races is your recovery, nutrition. You can kind of, although I don't recommend it, you can kind of get away with, you know, not having a recovery smoothie or whatever after your 5k race, you can kind of just like go about your day and you're not going to really feel much, but the longer distance races and training when your muscles are totally broken down and lactic acid is building up and you've got another long run, you know, a couple of days later, that's when you really, really need to, to pay attention to um, getting that good recovery nutrition in soon, soon within that recovery window, about 40, within 45 minutes of finishing your workout or race to help the body um, do its thing, do its repair work. It's it, like our blood, our bloodstream is flooded with enzymes that are open and hungry and like ready to absorb the protein and the carbs right after we finish. But if we wait too long, let's say we do a half marathon, we're sitting around chatting and looking at our results and an hour and a half goes by and then you're like, oh, I should probably go eat something. You you really missed an opportunity to help your body heal and repair and get stronger for your next workout and next race. So just, you know, really make sure to, to, you know, it's just like part of your race routine. You finish your race or you finish your workout and you have your uh, recovery meal or recovery shake, which is sometimes easier since it's liquid. And after a really hard effort, sometimes you don't feel like eating a solid meal, but drinking that down and um, helping your body repair is, is really important as the, vol- as the volume of training increases. All right. That's a great nugget of information. Thank you very much. Uh, does someone else, oh, Steve's got a question. I, I have a question. Why, why we have you on here, Meredith, it, in case you haven't noticed, I'm, I'm the one that goes all over the place. But uh, why we have you here, I want to ask you about high fructose corn syrup. I have read articles that, because we all know everything on the internet's true, but mm-hmm. I have I have read articles that claim it's a plot by the Illuminati to take over the world, and I have read stuff <laughs> from um, different papers that say chemically it's exactly the same as cane sugar. There's no difference. What's the truth? Uh, the truth? Well, I, <laughs> I, I don't advise it. I don't advise it for my clients, for myself, for my family. Um, I think in general, we all need to to cut the amount of sugar in all its forms. I, I think just particularly demonizing high fructose corn syrup isn't necessarily the most important thing. I think the bigger message is we're all consuming way too much sugar. And the average person consumes somewhere around 170 pounds of added sugar every year. If we go back to our great, great grandparents, they were consuming about five to seven pounds of added sugar a year. So you just look around and you can see what it's doing to our body, the the amount of added sugar and high fructose corn syrup specifically. I mean, yeah, there are, um, I've read um, papers um, that, that call out specific problematic aspects of high fructose corn syrup in terms of the way it affects our our liver, um, contributing to fatty liver, uh, which is that epidemic rates right now, like so many people are going to need liver transplant, liver transplant in the next several years, uh, decade for sure. And that's due to excess sugar, not from fat. It also negatively affects uh, HDL, the, the high density lipoprotein, uh, the good cholesterol that we want more of that kind of acts as like a vacuum going around and sucking up triglycerides in our bloodstream. It lowers LDL, the bad cholesterol. Um, so there's there's problems with it. And usually it's a marker of a low quality, highly processed food. I mean, that's where you'll see it. It's, it's cheaper than, let's say, molasses or honey. And so you're going to find it in foods that are going to have a lot of refined, uh, highly processed other ingredients. So I would just look at the big picture of what what it's in and then decide if that's something you want in your diet. Is that part of a runner diet? Is that going to make you feel good? Is it going to make you run faster or is it going to 
take you back a few steps. So I'm not a big fan, <laughs> personally. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Andy. It's just on my mind. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's fine. We'll go wherever we need to go. Uh, but anyone want to give some of the uh, Facebook questions from some of our listeners? Yeah, I'll start. Um, we have one from Richard. And so he wanted to know, and I think you've kind of answered this all already, but you can maybe expand on it. But if you had any preference um, towards um, low carb, high fat, paleo, plant based, or kind of traditional diet? So each one has its. Each one, each one of those diets definitely has its pros to it. Um, should we go through? Do you want to go through each of them a little bit, or do you think do you think everybody knows what all of them are, or or do we want to sort of explain or clarify like what low carb, high fat is? Yeah, why don't why don't you go through and kind of maybe talk about what some of the benefits or drawbacks okay. are? Sure. So low carb, high fat is a, a, a really popular right now. Um, I think it's sort of taken, it's it's sort of replaced, not replaced, a lot of people uh, still do paleo and uh, there's a lot of advantages to that as well. But more and more people are moving to low carb, high fat, and um, sort of to, to define what it is, I think, and it varies. Low carb is generally where you have 30% or less of your calories coming from carbohydrate. And then filling in the rest, about 20 to 25 percent protein, and then about 45 or 50 percent fat. That's kind of what we're talking about when we say low carb, high fat. I think this diet has grown in popularity as a result of people consuming way too many carbs. Uh, you know, a, a very carb heavy diet of very highly processed carbohydrates that are sort of filler food that that don't have a ton of nutrients that don't provide us a ton of what we need, but um, taking up too much space in our diet. Um, I think where low carb and high fat can go wrong is when people see carbohydrates all as the same and they don't distinguish between whole food, healthy carbohydrates that we all need, that our brain needs, that our muscles need, especially as runners. And they're sort of afraid of all carbohydrates. So really, you know, starting to distinguish between, um, you know, sweet potatoes and sugary cereal are both carbohydrates, totally different effect on the body. So really um, just knowing what are the good carbs and, and including the right amount for you in your body um, and in your diet. So everyone has a little bit different needs in terms of carbohydrate, depending on your activity level and your insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. If your blood sugar levels are very high and you are borderline type 2 diabetic, then you do want to moderate your carbs and bring them to a, uh, a lower level. But you have to keep in mind that you don't want to go too low because what happens specifically, especially for women, I've seen this happen quite often, they, they go to a low, very low carb diet and the body responds by increasing cortisol levels. It feels like it's under stress. Women's hormones don't <laughs> do very well with very, very low carbohydrate. It feels like stress. So the cortisol shoots up, the sharp sugar and carbohydrate cravings increase, the poor sleep increases. So a lot of negative effects from that. So really, I think with low carb, high fat, just making smart choices and understanding the difference between refined sugary carbohydrates versus whole food, healthy carbohydrates, and then making sure your healthy fats are from truly healthy fat sources and not just globbing on like more mayonnaise and um, adding tons of, you know, ranch dressing as your, as your fat, but really making smart choices there. Paleo, I think, you know, for all of these paleo plant-based traditional, they all have really great aspects. And I think the best part of paleo is that it's, it's really focused on whole natural foods it's, it sort of shuns sugar. Uh, it's going back to, you know, what we think the, the Stone Age caveman uh, was eating back then and trying to, trying to replicate that as best we can. I think, you know, some drawbacks to it is that um, we don't know exactly what they were eating. And, and it's gotten sort of modified along the way where you get to see a lot of the paleo brownies and the paleo pizza crust and everything's paleo. And, you know, it's, it's not exactly what the caveman was eating, but if you can take the, take the spirit of that and try to keep it, you know, pretty clean, lots of vegetables, high quality um, meat, 
pretty low sugar, you're you're doing pretty well there. Plant based is great if you're doing it with a with a strong plant focus. I see the problem with it um, for some people is they follow a vegetarian diet, but that just means they're not eating meat. They they're eating highly processed, like isolated soy, um, sort of fake meats instead of meat, and then not eating a lot of vegetables or not a, a great variety of vegetables. But a plant based diet can be a great place to really increase your veggies, get um, some great proteins from lentils and legumes, things like that. Um, one thing to be cautious of with plant-based is to make sure you have enough B12, which comes from um, animal products. So if you're a vegan, you do need to think about supplementing to get your B12 and also DHA and EPA from your omega-3 fatty acids because those come from fish. So, And then traditional diet, um, I think when they, the the questioner it said traditional, I assume they're talking about like an ancestral diet, which is fermented foods, bone broth, fat like butter, um, sprouted grains and, and grass fed meat. There's a lot of benefit to all of those foods. And you'll start to see, start to see, you know, a lot of those traditional healing foods um, coming into fashion now with like bone broth stores popping up, things like that. So yeah, definitely some, some great elements there. Um, but again, when you read about a diet and you hear someone saying, this is what you got to do, I think you take that with a grain of salt and you, you try it and you see how it works for yourself, keeping in mind bioindividuality that maybe a plant-based diet works great for your friend who does very well and feels great with a lot of plant protein, but you know yourself that you need like red meat. <laughs> Sometimes you just, you just crave it. You feel good w when you have it. And so don't force yourself into a dietary theory that seems like the best one this month or, you know, this mm -hmm. year, stick to your, stick to trust your gut and, and go back to sort of like the, the most sound principles. And then you can make adjustments and, and tweak as you go, always trust yourself. I think, I think we are, are we know, each, we know ourselves better than anyone, any nutrition expert or anyone. So um, uh, don't be afraid to experiment, but always go back to what you know will make you feel good. Yeah. You know, someone once told me, and, and you can tell me if you agree or disagree, that the best diet is to eat a healthy version of your cultural diet. Because here I'm thinking, you know, paleo okay caveman didn't live past like 20 so you know i don't want to eat what they're eating you know the mongols they conquered the known world eating horse meat so you know so just it, it, that advice sounded good to me and i was just wondering if there's any logic to it i do think there there um there is logic to that i think well there's um the blood type diet which was quite popular several years ago that is based on that that you know we each came from different areas of the world. And so we, you know, through evolution, we are pre-designed to be able to digest and feel better eating certain types of food. So, you know, I'm, I'm half Asian and I don't do well with milk at all. I have my mom to thank for that. Um, so while, you know, some people will say you have to have milk, milk is good for your bones and you need it for calcium. I know that it doesn't make me feel good. If I have, if I feel bloated and I, you know, start to break out, well, then that's, that's thanks to milk for me. And there's all sorts of different examples like that um, based on, based on your blood type, based on where your ancestors came from. So yeah, again, it's just like know yourself. And that's where the, the new, the study of genes and nutrition are kind of coming together and people are able to find out more about what, what foods will will likely make them um, feel great and um, stave off illness based on their specific uh, genotype. So pretty interesting stuff. And I guess if that was true, I should be one heck of a beer drinker and I'm not. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, should we go to the next question? Yes. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll take this one. Let's see if I can make this out. This is from Tony. With regards to low ca low carb, high fat, can you ask to relate that to optimizing fat metabolism as low carb, high fat is a tool to that end, but 
And there is a whole gambit in regards to the range of carb totals and training to get to burn more, burn fat more effectively or efficiently. Did that make any sense? I think I get what they're asking. I think, I think he's asking about fat being, becoming fat, fat adapted. adapted. Yeah. Yeah. And that is um, something that more and more endurance athletes are, are moving um, toward to learning about and, and experimenting with. And um, seeing some really good results with too. And so the idea is that we have uh, a certain number of calories stored in our body as sugar, as glycogen stored in our muscles and in our liver. And we have about each of us has about anywhere from 1400 to 1800 calories worth of, of sugar or glycogen to use during during our workouts. We also have this great supply of fat <laughs> that um, even the, the leanest person um, is going to have around 80,000 calories of fat that they have and that can be used to um, fuel their, their, their workout or their race. Now, the trick is like, how do you get your body to get, not, not skip past, but um, burn, be able to burn more fat and less sugar? And if you do that successfully, then you actually minimize the amount of sugary refueling options that you need during a during a race, especially a long course race. And that's why I think um, the interest in this has has really increased because so many people through long course racing, their Ironman or ultra distance um, uh, running ha- deal with a lot of gastric issues when they get to a certain point in the race because you know, they just can't tolerate the sugar coming in at a certain level. They start to shut down and then they don't, they, and then they dip. <laughs> I'm surprised it's quiet in my house <laughs> right now. Um, so they're looking for ways to be able to access that stored fat. And the way to do that, and again, <laughs> it's going to be a little bit different for everyone in terms of the, in terms of the, the right ratios of, of carbohydrate and fat. But the idea is to increase healthy fats, lower overall carb carbohydrates so that your body is sort of forced to um, not always grab for glycogen. Glycogen is really easy for the body to access. It likes to burn it. It's, it's easy to burn, but you want to sort of almost trick your body to, to um, look for that stored fat. Now, a really important piece of this is that you have to match your training effort and intensity to to the right heart rate. So if you are, so you have to know your training zones and know your sweet spots for burning fat, and you have to stay within that training zone if you're going to be able to burn fat. A lot of people train at a heart rate zone that is above their fat for, above their fat burning zone where they're actually burning sugar. So if they're at a uh, heart rate zone that is high enough that they have surpassed their anaerobic threshold. Their body is not able to access fat as a as a fuel, and now it's burning sugar. And you have now depleted your carbohydrate level, so you have very little glycogen. You're going to be in a really painful spot. So if you do go about the fat adapted, low carb, high fat, you need to really be careful and just be really. Um, disciplined about staying in the right heart rate training zones. One of the downsides to it is like the, you kind of have to go in that slow, easy pace for quite some time for your body to get fully adapted to it. You're going to not be able to do a lot of tempo runs, a lot of speed, inter- high speed intervals, track workouts, things like that. You're going to kind of have to chug along a slow, easy pace um, in order for your body to shift from that um, wanting to, to, burn sugar and in the and instead burn fat all right andy you want to take the next one sure thing uh this is from uh, andrew and uh, what is the truth if any behind carb loading does it work is it a waste of time and uh, how much pasta or other high carb food uh, can i consume in one sitting and mm-hmm. have it be a benefit before or uh it's just too much for the or is it just too much for the body to process oh great question I think, uh, especially for beginner runners, this is like the first thing that they think they need to do before a big, a big training run or before a race. They'll, you know, load up on bowls and bowls of, of pasta 
because they were told to carb load. So I do think um, it has its place, but not uh, to the extent that of importance that we placed upon it. So the idea, the idea of carbo loading is that you want to top off your glycogen stores and make sure that they're full before your big training run or before your big race so that you don't get out there and, you know, an hour into it, you feel like you've hit the wall. So how do you do that from a practical standpoint? And well, I should back up. It, it also depends a lot on um, your race distance. So <laughs> I made a huge mistake when I first started out running. This is like 98. I signed up for my first 5K. My sister, my good friend, we all did it. And we had like a big old pasta party the night before. We're like, we need to have our carbs. So I had like two bowls of spaghetti and like garlic bread. And I'm like, hey, I have my carbs. And Oh, I felt like I felt like crap the next day. I mean, I, like my stomach was bloated and I had to use the bathroom a couple of times. Um, so excessive. That would be an example of excessive carbohydrate before a 5K, 5K race. You do. So let's say you're, I would say uh, the race distance at which it becomes more important to be um, making sure you have plenty of uh, adequate carbohydrate the day before is like half marathon distance, I think is like where you're going to be out there long enough that you really want to make sure the glycogen stores are topped off. And how do you do that from a practical standpoint? I don't actually advise my athletes to do a big uh, carbohydrate loaded dinner because usually they're up really early. The race is really early and their body hasn't even digested through all of that spaghetti or whatever. So what I recommend is the day before, let's say they have uh, a marathon on Sunday morning. On um, Saturday, what I will have them do is have a, a carb rich late breakfast. So they might do like a little shakeout run in the morning and then they'll have and it's like everyone's favorite part of their training is they get to go have like this great breakfast with extra pancakes and some bananas and then fruit smoothie, um, some eggs, whatever. It's just like a giant, it's going to be their biggest meal of the day where they've topped off their glycogen stores. They're probably tired. So they'll go lay down and like get off their feet, which is what they're supposed to do before their, their big race anyways. And then they'll have a normal, whatever normal is for anyone, um, dinner kind of early on, like be done eating by let's say seven o'clock if their race is at seven in the morning, like to give them a good 12 hour window so the body can digest, do its thing and not feel heavy, sluggish, um, in the morning. Cause that's, that is what tends to happen if you eat too many carbohydrates late at night for the race, you feel sluggish in the morning. We don't want that. Crystal, would you like to ask what is perhaps the most important question on this list? <laughs> yes, because it's <laughs> ours. <laughs> <laughs> so on this Saturday, we were we are all headed down to Paducah, Kentucky, and we are doing a 10-hour race. But oh. yeah, by the time this airs, this will be this will be done. Okay. So this is this is really just selfish that we need this now. <laughs> right. Um so so it's a 10 hour race, but the trick is it starts at eight o'clock at night. Okay. So for it's a long distance night race. How should we oh. fuel the day before the day of? I we're all kind of feeling. Are, are you all starting at eight o'clock or is it like yes. a relay? Okay. No, you're all it's, starting it's at night. 10 hours straight. All of oh. us at the same time. Okay. So what I would do is um, like have your extra carby extra pancakes, whatever breakfast, uh, dinner, it's going to be like dinner. So it's not going to be pancakes probably unless you like breakfast for dinner, but you're going to do that. What day is your race? Saturday? Saturday night. Yes. Saturday night. So Friday, like happy hour time, you want to have your, your bigger meal and that'll kind of carry you over, tap off your glycogen stores and um, be digested enough that you'll, you won't feel sluggish by, by nighttime. And then the day of, you know, hydrate really well, I would eat sort of normal, you know, you know, regular breakfast, eat a, a regular lunch um, with your protein and healthy fat and, and veggies, um, whatever. And then I, I'm not big on, on um, eating too much. Like, so if you're starting at eight, I would probably have a, a light meal at like, probably five, you know, like early dinner. And then, you know what, Crystal, do you have the energy pudding? Have you ever made that? You can no, share that I do. 
<laughs> yeah, I have the recipe and I do want to try it. Maybe I'll pack some. That's a good you know, idea. That The reason why I bring that up is, is because it's super, super easy to digest and it's very nutrient dense and it will give you great energy. So, and it, so that you could eat at like, let's say you're, you're feeling kind of hungry, like you want something. I would have that at like six thirty, seven 7 o'clock and that'll take you through your, to the, you know, start of the race and, and very easy to digest. No gastric di- distress or bloating or anything with that. And maybe you whip, whip up a batch for your friend. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm bringing the magic energy pudding, guys. Yes. <laughs> Andy, will will you be bringing some? Will you be bringing some delicious cloud meat sticks? Because because I've only got like two left. And those yeah, st- I haven't got to try the cloud meat. Sticks. They are magic. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring a bunch of them. It'll be we'll, we'll have we'll have a whole case of them. They are magic the on cloud them. meat sticks. I want one. <laughs> See, I thought it was a myth until and then I discovered. No, it. no, it, no. It, it's a real thing. Okay, so w- whenever I'm not a professional podcaster and elite athlete, uh, <laughs> in my real job, uh, I, I actually oh, there there it is right there. Stephen's holding. Uh, oh. I, I, our, our, our family owns a, uh, owns a meat processing plant. And okay. so we actually, all, all that processed food that you hate, I, I make that. But <laughs> I'm, I'm like back here, just kind of just, just. <laughs> but I, I am making some formula improvements to where I'm taking out a lot of the, uh, a lot of like the nitrites, sodium, uh, tripolyphosphates, uh, sodium erythropates. I'm replacing those with real foods like celery juice powder, for the antioxidant, I'm using uh, cherry cherry juice powder, and so I'm I'm really cleaning up that label. So yes, while it is yes. a well, it is a, a, a sausage that is a processed food. We're kind of cleaning them up a little bit, and uh, and so anyway, it's been very popular. Just like today, I had someone contact me; they wanted me to make uh, make them some uh, uh, bacon to private label for them, um, but you know, with uh, with uh, no sugar and no nitrites, and so you know, I'm replacing that with sea salt, celery juice powder, and and putting together a, a at least healthier type bacon for them. So so anyway, I love that. I love that. I think that's great. And and I should clarify, I, I'm not against processed meats period um i'm against the nitrates <laughs> the yeah. pres- those preservatives so i love what you're doing to to elevate that that's fantastic yeah. and cherry juice in your in your meat stick that's awesome every runner should be having that as recovery food cloud meat sticks took me through an entire 50k so <laughs> can you do and you can do an entire 50k on one meat stick no what i have like 10 of them <laughs> <laughs> no, I had more than that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask what is perhaps the second most important question all night. Okay. This is a, this is another one from Andrew, and I want you to think on this one because it is vital. Okay. How many beers is the optimal amount for post race recovery? Wait. So how, how oh, many? True or false? <laughs> how no, many no, how, beers? How many? <laughs> Depends on the distance of the race. (laughs) The longer the race, the more beers you get to have at the end. Well, that'll make Andrew happy because he's an ultra runner and Ah. I'm a fan. And he just actually this past weekend did um, Triple T, T, which is three um, triathlons in, or no, four triathlons in three days. So you just justified all of his uh, beer drinking. <laughs> Absolutely. You got to replace those lost carbohydrates and restore the glycogen. So you go. <laughs> just make sure it's a high quality beer. It's a good beer. <laughs> Craft beer or whatever beer you like. Okay. Uh, Robert, he he had a question that I really liked. And uh, this, and his question is, how uh, how many calories can one cut and not affect performance? Is there any foods one should include in their must-haves every day? Uh, Is there such a thing as too many carbs from fruits? And finally, for me, um, I've been on – he's been around 170-ish. And then no matter how many calories he cuts, he just can't get past that. So is there a baseline weight that one can't get past without extreme measures? And he's he's just a little bit under six foot. So he's got a lot of questions there. Okay. Um, uh, let's kind of break this down to uh, what foods is a must have for every day. I, I think, it, I mean, it's like the basics. It goes back to your good proteins, your healthy fats, your, your variety of fibrous vegetables. I mean, those are, those are standard. If you can look at your plate and see some of those on every plate, you're going to be in good shape. It's, it's simple. It's not always easy to to put that together, but those are the nutrient dense foods. I mean, most of us, are not lacking calories. Most of us are lacking nutrients. And so our body then thinks it's hungry, keeps 
looking for those nutrients in the nutrient deficient foods that we're overdoing. So we're overfed and undernourished. So if we can really focus on, you know, your real foods, your, your veggies, your your meats or, or fish, um, eggs, and um, and your healthy fats, you're, you're going to be in good shape. In terms of, um, it sounds like he's he's trying to lose weight. He's not sure how much he should cut calories by. He's um, about six foot and 170. So seems about right to me <laughs> he wants to, to, um, to lose more. So here's, here's the deal. Um, what you want to do, what you need to do is know your resting metabolic rate as your baseline. This is the number of calories that your body needs at total rest. If you were to lay in bed and look at the ceiling all day long, your body still needs X amount of calories to function. For the average woman, that's about 1400 calories. For the average man, it's about 1700 calories. If you follow a diet program that says you need to slash calories, and most women then are told to eat 1,200 calories a day, and most men are told to eat 1,500 calories a day, um, you're going to run into trouble because you're eating below your resting metabolic rate, and the body doesn't like that. And the body responds by shutting everything down, lowering your thyroid output, cannibalizing lean muscle tissue, which which makes your metabolic rate tick down. It senses stress. It senses a lack of fuel, lack of food, lack of calories. And so to survive, it's going to sort of low, lower um, everything, lower your energy output. So you don't ever want to eat below your resting metabolic rate. But um, the other things you have to consider is your everyday activity. Like let's say you you, um, have a job where you walk around a little bit throughout the day, but mostly sedentary, you still will probably burn about 500 calories doing your everyday job. Um, So you add that to your resting metabolic rate. So then the third element to factor in is the amount of calories that you're burning from your running, from your exercise. And you add those all together, your resting metabolic rate, your everyday activity rate, and your exercise calorie burn. And let's say that total is comes out to 2,500 calories a day. Let's let's say that's that's your total burn. If you're trying to lose weight, you would want to trim about 20 to 30 percent, make a little bit of a deficit into that. Everything that you're putting out um, in terms of energy, you cut it by about 25 to 30 percent, and not more than that. That's where people make a lot of mistakes. They cut way more than that, and then they're starting to negatively impact their resting metabolic rate. The metabolism ticks down. They feel sluggish, they feel tired, they feel hungry and cranky because their body wants food, um, and then they can't do it for very long, so then they overeat, they gain the weight quickly because their metabolism has been slowed down, and the whole cycle begins again. So you can, if you want to track calories and count calories, you can do that, but make sure that the deficit is a moderate amount of about 25 to 30% of your total energy output for the day. All right, Meredith, you, you are just an absolute wealth of knowledge here, and this is great. Unfortunately, the bad thing about that is is that uh, we could just go on forever. And, but one thing that I really, really want to get in, because I think this is going to be a lot of fun, and we're just going to do this just rapid fire. We're going to go on a virtual grocery shopping trip. So I um, love that. Yeah, so, so, so me, without my children, okay. uh, I, I've just gone to the grocery store, I've got my cart, and I'm going to start heading down all the aisles. Okay. And so there's going to be two things that I'm going to ask for you to give me okay. is that whenever I'm in that department, what is, what is one thing that needs to go in my cart? Uh-huh. And that is, and that, and what is one thing from that department that we might think is healthy, but we should probably avoid or, or maybe just be careful of that because, sure. you know, it sounds healthy, but it's not that good for us. So, Got okay. It. Rapid fire. Let's go. <laughs> okay. I'm in the vegetable lightning aisle. Round. Okay. The lightning round. Go. Pick up kale, which you already do. Yeah. Or, oh, what? <laughs> no. Did we not start? <laughs> no, 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 we're, we're going, we're going. Okay. Um, definitely get your leafy greens, kale, dandelion greens, um, arugula, be, be adventurous, and then skip the corn, skip the sweet corn, the starchy, too sweet. Okay. Skip Fruit the- aisle. Fruit aisle. Uh, get an avocado, a bag of avocados. They're actually fruit or blueberries. Um, skip the dried fruit, specifically the banana chips, pure yeah. sugar. All right. Bread aisle. Bread aisle. Skip the sandwich thins. 
oh my gosh, people think those are like so light and healthy and airy. <laughs> There's nothing in them except, um, you know, enriched, enriched flour and then added back in um, uh, synthetic vitamins. So skip the enriched breads and pick up some Ezekiel bread, which is sprouted grain, no flour, low glycemic. The meat department. It, meat. Get your meat sticks. <laughs> 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 I like your meat sticks. Um, <laughs> can I say seafood? I would say get a can of sardines. I mean, they're like the easiest, cheapest, uh, most nutrient dense, healthy fat. Get the, your omega threes from your sardines. Okay. Yep. Your dairy cakes. Oh, wait, can I say what to skip? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would skip the the honey roasted ham that has the nitrates. Most of them do have nitrates. Okay. okay. What's the next one? Dairy cakes. Dairy. Um, pick up some whole, plain Greek yogurt, full fat, so it's rich and creamy. Get the fat-free, fruit-added, fruit-flavored yogurt, full of sugar. It has like your whole daily intake of sugar in one carton, which you think is healthy. It's not. Okay, the chips and cracker aisle. Get some nuts. <laughs> Don't actually get, <laughs> get, get a variety of uh, cashews and almonds, uh, walnuts. Grab your nuts. They might be in the, They might be near that aisle. Skip okay. the um, skip the pretend healthy chips, like the quinoa infused flax seed chips, which are just chips. And then you think they're healthy, so you eat the whole bag. If you really yeah. want chips, get chips and just eat like a little bit. Okay. Now that probably includes my favorite Cool Ranch Doritos, but we won't go there. Uh, the the frozen <laughs> aisle. I like Cool Ranch Doritos. Um, frozen <laughs> aisle. Tart cherries. Frozen tart cherries absolutely essential for a, an athlete of any kind really helps to reduce inflammation. It's like taking a leave or Advil, but without any of the gastrointestinal and uh, leaky gut problems of taking too much a leave and Advil. So tart cherries and add them to your smoothies or add them to yogurt, eat them plain, skip the prepared frozen lean cuisine type frozen entrees, which are just loaded with salts and not a lot of not a lot of nutrients there. So, yeah. All right. My grocery cart is full. <laughs> it's full. <laughs> So, so anyway, one, one thing uh, while we're wrapping things up, uh, I want to know, how, how does nutrition coaching work? So in general or with me? <laughs> yeah, with, with, with you. With you. How, with how, we, how, how we, uh, you would approach a client? So I, my approach is to always teach first because I think people, there are things that, no shortage of, of nutrition advice and and dietary advice, meal plans on the internet. You can get all of that. What people are missing is the is the knowledge, like sound knowledge of why and, and the why. So first you you get, teach them, and then you tell them why you want them to try to have more of X Y Z in their cart, and that really seems to make a difference in terms of long-term behavior change like a light bulb clicks on They're like oh if i need to eat you know tart cherries because i'm super sore after every run and i can't even stand up to okay well i can do that but if i'm just told to eat tart cherries because it's low cal and it fits in my daily diet well that's not motivating at all so i really try to explain why we're adding in these particular foods and then helping them with actual habit change because knowledge is just one piece of it. We can know everything, but we can be implementing nothing and not seeing any positive change or, or progression. So it's a lot of accountability and taking small and simple steps, not changing everything overnight. People don't do well with like completely changing everything that they eat. If you love Cool Ranch Doritos, you should be able to have Cool Ranch Doritos. It, it, it's part of your life. Like I, I'm not into, you know, all or nothing completely black or white, um, you know, clean eating 100% of the time. It's it, Food is fuel, but food is also so much more. I mean, it's it's about community. It's about um, enjoyment. It's about ritual and family recipes. So weaving all of those things into a, a nutritional plan that works for you, that makes you feel good, but then also allows for uh, indulgences, intentional indulgences that you have with your family or your significant other or whatever. Um, it's all, you know, we're foodies. We love food. We don't want to just like look at it like it's this thing that has to be consumed. So really just kind of having a, a healthy, healthy relationship with food. I think that's, that's a big piece of it too. 
Well, where can uh, some of our listeners, uh, if they want to get in touch with you or learn a little bit more about your services, how, how can they find you? You can find me on Facebook at Meredith Vaselli, uh, or Instagram, Meredith Vaselli as well. Um, my website hopefully will be up by the time this broadcast. Um, my husband is feverishly working on it in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> He's a designer, but somehow I get, I'm like, last on his client list. Um, but I am working on that. I've got some um, new group coaching programs coming out um, that I'm really excited about. Um, but you can find me on Facebook. I I, um, I do Facebook Lives where I do Q&As for people. Um, I'm going to start doing that on a weekly basis and just love the interaction. People have a lot of questions and um, so love to share what I know and love to, to keep learning from from everyone as well. So that's where you can find me. All right. Crystal, Stephen, do you have any questions? No, no, just that we'll have uh, all your links in our show notes so people can click right there to find you. And I have watched some of your, well, not live, but recorded lives, and they are they're very uh, educational. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, they are wonderful. And I've actually gone through um, one of um, Meredith's um, coaching, uh, one of the group sessions, and it was absolutely wonderful. I learned so, so much. So appreciative. And uh, I know she's coming out with the uh, mastery program for that. Yeah. So I plan on going through that as well. And just awesome. just a wonderful person. Thank you, Meredith. Oh, thank you. And I, I really loved getting to know you through the group. And you're sort of one of those really awesome people that like, they hear something and then they actually go and do it. And then they actually come back and report like, Hey, that worked really well. <laughs> it's, like, it's great. <laughs> it's a great process. So yeah, really excited the- to continue working with you. I do have to admit, I have a big bag of Cool Ranch Doritos already packed for Saturday's trip. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Actually sounds really good. It's funny, side quick story. When I was pregnant with my first son, all I wanted was Cool Ranch Doritos. That was, <laughs> that was like my huge craving. And not the regular ones, but like Cool Ranch. Something about them just totally oh. hit the spot. So I hear you. <laughs> it's my 20%. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a good 20%. Totally worth it. <laughs> well, good luck, you guys. I want to hear about your race. We we post, we do a podcast about your about your 10 hour race. We podcast yeah, we, during the race. Yeah, yeah we, we certainly plan to do some audio while we're there and take some uh, photos and might might have a video go along with it. And so we'll be able to share that with everyone. Very cool. It's hilly in Paducah, isn't it? Well, <laughs> we're, we're going to be on a horse track. So it's not oh, my God. a half mile horse track that we're going to go around and around for 10 hours in the dark. No way. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> I'll be thinking of you. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, we, we've lost Steven's audio, which might, might be fortunate now that we're, now we're, we're look at that. He's, he's, he's talking and he can't hear us. So this is pretty great. So, anyway, well, we're going to wrap things up. Meredith, thank you so much for uh, uh, giving so uh, generous with your time and coming on to the show and uh, and uh, it, ho- hopefully uh, maybe someday we can have you again and we can talk some more love and get that. some more of these questions that uh, we, we missed that. out on. All right. Thanks you guys so much. It's a lot of fun. All right. Thank you. Well, we'd like to give a shout out to the Ozark Mountain Daredevils for our theme music. Uh, we'd like to ask everyone if you want more information to visit www.heartlandrunning.com. Uh, that's where you're going to get the expanded show notes for that. Uh, check us out on Instagram. And also, don't forget to join our Facebook group. That's where all the fun happens. And that gives you an opportunity to ask some questions that could be on a podcast. Don't forget to call our voicemail at 417-319-1060. And uh, that way, if you want to give us a uh, race review, you want to talk about some gear or just generally geek out about running, uh, if we like what you have to say, we'll put you on the show. Uh, make sure you go to iTunes and give us a review and tell a friend. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm Andy. And I'm Crystal. And I'm Steven. Oh, there he is. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Am I back now? Yeah, you're back now. You're, you're back, back now. That is Hello. the weirdest thing. Huh. Interesting. Meredith, I'm back I, in time to say goodbye. I, but I have, I have a question before we go. I have one last okay, question, awesome. and I need Meredith's okay. permission for this because I want to get a T-shirt made. When you're in the chip aisle, grab your nuts. Can I? Can I? Can I use that? <laughs> yes. yes, you have my permission. Thank you. I would like to do that on every front. <laughs> I, I even wrote it down. <laughs> All right. Well, thank goodness we got his audio back for that question. For that, for that question. <laughs> so we'll, we'll try again. And we'll, 
we'll end it on that. I'm Andy. And I'm Crystal. <laughs> and I'm Steven. <laughs> and we'll see you guys later. Well, I'm- <laughs>